right, we'll go ahead and get started. So before we dive, dive into today's class, I like to start with what is a credit union? So if you're not familiar with what a credit union is, we provide not-for-profit banking products, loans, and services to our members. Credit unions are also owned by their members, so they have a say in how the credit union is led and operated. Every member is an owner, so when you put that $5 into your share savings at Zing, that is your share or your ownership of the credit union. So it's a democratic financial institution where members vote for the board of directors to have a say in how the credit union is run. A little bit about Zing and who we are. Our mission is to educate, deliver, and achieve. We want to have a well financially educated community so they can achieve their goals. As I mentioned, we are a not-for-profit financial institution and we have been serving Denver since 1934. Um, we were previously known as Denver Community Credit Union. We did rebrand to Zing Credit Union in April and we are still the same institution that's been here since 1934. Um, so no changes there. This class is a part of our free financial education program that was established back in 2005. That includes our live classes like this one today. We also have recorded classes on our website. So let's say someone you know maybe missed this class but would still like to check it out. Um, they can go to our website at myzing.com slash recordings and check out all of our previous live classes. Um, those are typically between uh, 45 minutes to an hour for those recordings. We also offer one-on-one -on -one financial coaching. So if you want to pull a copy of your credit reports and go through those with somebody or create a budget, pay down debt, talk about retirement, um, all of those things we could discuss during a free coaching session. And then we also have e-learning courses available on our website in both English and Spanish. Uh, they're about five to 10 minute modules over um, a variety of different topics from home buying, um, buying a car, building savings, family conversations, about money and so on. Without any further ado, we will go ahead and hop into today's content discussing credit. So to familiarize everyone with credit terminology and vocabulary we'll be using today, we're going to talk about four different people's credit situations. <clears throat> so first we have Brad. Brad has zero trade lines or lines of trade. And when we say a trade line or line of trade, that's basically any open and active loan, credit account, or line of credit that's actively being reported to the credit bureaus. If it's not reported to the credit bureaus, it's not a trade line. We'll talk about two different loan types. The first one is revolving loans. These are things where you have up to a certain balance and then you can make multiple charges um, and then pay it off at the end of the month or whenever you receive your statement. These are gonna be things like uh, credit cards, overdraft lines of credit um, and other lines of credit like that. Installment loans are when you borrow a certain dollar amount of money and then you pay back every month that same dollar amount until it's completely paid off. Um, so these are going to be things like your car loan, a personal loan, mortgage, anything like that that's paid in installments over a specified term. Brad has had two inquiries in the last six months. Um, so soft inquiries do not impact your credit score and you're never penalized for pulling your own credit information. Um, so these soft inquiries are oftentimes related to um, maybe background purposes for employment or housing or something along those lines. Um, and I apologize, looks like my screen got a little cut off here at the bottom, but a hard inquiry does impact your credit score. So hard inquiries impact your credit score. Um, and basically you're going to see a hard inquiry anytime you're applying for a new line of trade or a new loan. So if you apply for a new credit card, um, that's going to be a hard inquiry. And if you apply for a loan, you're going to see your credit score drop anywhere from three to five points, maybe a month later, um, even if you apply for it and didn't open it. Anytime you apply for a new trade line, um, you'll see about a three to five point drop in your score there from that hard inquiry. But like I said, soft inquiries do not impact your score. They will not hurt your credit score. 
Next, we have Greg. So Greg here has some unpaid collection accounts. Um, and basically what a collection account is, is when you have a debt that's owed to a lender or a company, um, they're oftentimes sold to a separate collection agency after 180 days of no payments. Um, so basically, let's say if I have a, you know, a bill with DirecTV that I haven't paid for 180 days, DirecTV will sell that debt to a collection agency. And when that happens, it displays as a new additional negative account on your credit report. Um, because you already have the, the negative account from DirecTV with those late payments, and then it will display as a new one with that collection agency as well. Any collection account is damaging regardless of the balance owed. So it could be $25, it could be $1,000 both are going to be very damaging. So it's very good. If you can pay off those collections, you will see a significant jump in your credit score. Greg's length of credit history is about 72 months. So he's been using credit for a little while. And the longer that you have a positive credit history, like on-time payments, the better off your credit score will be. Um, so I recommend trying to keep your credit history as long as possible, um, as long as you're not having to pay a lot of unnecessary fees. Next, we have Helen. So Helen has 39 trade lines and 24 paid accounts. Um, I would assume that Helen is some sort of business owner. Most people uh, don't have this many trade lines. Helen is current on her accounts, including her mortgage. That just means that she's paid everything on time. She has about $10,560 in credit card balances, but her total available credit is around $70,000. Um, so if we look at how much she's using of her available credit, if we divide that $10,560 divided by $70,000, she's sitting at about 15%. So she's using about 15% of the credit available to her. Um, and no delinquent accounts and no late payments. So she doesn't have any collections, no late payments. So that's good stuff. If you do have a late payment, because mistakes do happen, accidents happen, sometimes auto pay doesn't go through. Um, if you have a late payment, it is uh, reported to the credit bureaus. It can stay on your credit report for up to seven years. I don't want that to scare anyone. Um, I know seven years sounds like a really long time. You will probably see an initial drop in your credit score, but as long as you're making your other payments on time, you're not maxing out your credit cards and so on, um, your score should bounce back uh, as long as your credit usage stays consistent and you're not having several late payments stacking up there. Uh, and oftentimes late payments are reported to the credit bureaus after being 30 or more days late, but not always. So it kind of depends on the company or the lender. Um, but I know, for example, I um, missed a student loan payment because my auto pay did not go through. It just stopped working for that month, I guess. Um, and I think I was about 15 days late. I did incur a late fee, but it was not reported to the credit bureaus as a late payment. Um, so like I said, it kind of depends on the company or lender, but we do kind of go by this 30 day rule before it's reported. Lastly, we have Sarah. So Sarah filed for bankruptcy in 2019. Um, bankruptcy is a last resort legal process. There are two types. Um, most bankruptcy filers will repay debt after filing Chapter 13, which stays on a credit report for seven years. Um, and Chapter 7 bankruptcy is less common, which will stay on your credit report for 10 years. Um, and medical debt is the top reason for bank bankruptcy filings in the United States. Sarah has had nine inquiries in the last six months. So she's applied for um, credit nine different times, which is quite a bit. Uh, she is maxed out on her credit cards. When we say maxed out, um, that means that she's at or above her credit limit on a line of credit. Uh, most times we're referring to credit cards there. Um, when we say credit utilization, basically that's just the percentage of the limit used on a revolving loan. So if we think back to Helen just a second ago, she was at 15% credit utilization, where when you're maxed out like Sarah here, she's at 100% credit utilization. But one good thing about Sarah here is she hasn't missed a, pay a payment since bankruptcy. So that's good. 
All right, a little poll question here. You can just respond in the chat box if you'd like. So what do you think is the best definition of credit? Letter A, credit is a number that lenders use to determine whether to give you a loan or not. Or B, credit is confidence in a borrower's ability and intention to repay. What do you think, A or B? I have a B, anyone else? All right, I'm getting lots of Bs and all of my B people, you are correct. Um, so the overall definition of credit is just knowing if someone's going to be able to pay back or not. Um, letter A is actually the definition of a credit score. It's that physical number that we use for lending. All right, so diving into credit reports. What's in a credit report? What are we going to see there? We're going to see personal information, a lot of personal information here. So you wanna keep these reports very secure. You don't wanna share these with anyone, um, keep these private. So personal information is going to include your name, social security number, birth date, um, addresses and previous addresses you may have lived at and your phone number. I will also include your loan account information. So that's any accounts that have been opened or closed in the last seven to 10 years. So even if you paid off your car loan, it will still probably be on there uh, for several more years. It will also include dates your accounts have been opened and closed, your payment history, so you can see if you've missed any payments, credit utilization, account balances, and payment statuses. Public records are going to include things like bankruptcies, foreclosures, tax liens, and civil judgments. So not everyone uh, will have something for a public record on there. Um, and then lastly, your inquiries. And these can also be called a hit on your credit report. Uh, so if you hear someone say a hit, um, that's the same thing as an inquiry. Um, things that are not included in your credit report, your income, bank information, race, or employment status. You won't see any of that in there. One thing that is important to note is that businesses, including lenders, do not have to report to credit bureaus. So that's why it's important just anytime you're getting a new loan or credit card or line of trade in general to just ensure they do report to the credit bureaus. There are three separate credit bureaus in total and they are for-profit companies. They will try and charge you um, to receive a copy of your credit report, but uh, in a couple of slides, I'm gonna share a free resource where you can access your credit reports for free. So Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax are the three credit bureaus. Um, Experian is personally my favorite just because if you make an account with them, they will provide you with a free copy of your credit report and credit score each month. Um, so Experian is pretty awesome. The other two don't have as many resources available. And then as I mentioned, credit scores are based only on the information and in your credit report. So that's just why it's so important to ensure that your lines of trade are reporting to credit bureaus. All right, so this is just a sample credit report. Oftentimes when you pull reports, they're going to be several pages long, so much longer than this here, but you just wanna look for five different information zones or areas. So first one, personal information. Look over this rather carefully. About 20% of Americans have some sort of error on their credit report. So just look over these very carefully, especially if you're pulling it um, for the first time in a while. Two is your public records or your legal items. We don't have anything on this one. Um, three is your collection. So you can see here, one collection from July, 2018, uh, $500. And oftentimes on your credit report, you will also see contact information for this collection agency. So you can reach out to them to resolve that debt. Number four, trade line. This is where probably the thickest area of your credit report might be. Um, so this is any trade lines that have been opened or closed in the last seven to 10 years. You can see here they have three, the last date that it was reported, the date the line was opened, the highest credit limit, the balance left over, and status is current for all of those. So that just means that it's paid on time. Lastly, um, there's your inquiries. So this, I believe, will show both hard and soft inquiries. Um, so the cell phone provider was probably a soft inquiry, uh, and the card issuer was probably a hard, or 
excuse me, the cell phone is issuer was probably a soft inquiry uh, for like background purposes. And then card issuer was probably a hard inquiry since they were applying for a loan. All right, so this is a really good time to write this website down or take a quick screenshot if you haven't heard of this already. So like I mentioned, mistakes are common on credit reports. So just keep an eye out, look over them carefully. Um, and you can go to annualcreditreport.com for free reports every 12 months. Um, due to the pandemic, reports were available weekly through April of 2022. I am not sure if that's been extended. Um, so right now, I would still stick with the free reports once every 12 months. Um, due to the pandemic, there was a lot of fraud going on and scams, so that's why they made them available weekly. Um, and one other great thing about this website is you can dispute any errors or inaccurate information and have it removed for free. So you can do it all in-house on this one website. So highly recommend writing this down or screenshotting it if you can. Now we're gonna look at when is a credit score important? So we're gonna walk through um, a series of different um, accounts or things we may come across at one point in our life and knowing if credit is going to be important for these or not. Number one is a checking account. So checking account goes in the middle because some financial institutions will check your credit score and you have to have a certain score to be able to open a checking account there. Um, at Zing Credit Union, we do not do a credit check. Uh, we check something called check systems, which is basically just to see if you have like a derogatory balance at an out at a, another financial institution. So for example, if I had like $300 in overdraft fees at Wells Fargo and I came to open an account at Zing, um, that's what we would see. We don't do a credit check. Next is getting employment. Um, this one really depends on your industry or field you're going into and what type of work that you'll be doing. So kind of just depends if your credit will be important based on your career choice. Rent to own store. This one is also in the middle. Um, this one is, this is kind of like a rent to center or something like that. Um, we used to put that in the credit score is not important category. Um, but we had a couple members say that they went to a rent to center type place and their credit score was checked. So I think that one kind of just depends um, on the place or what company you're using. A credit score is important for getting a place to rent. Um, having a good score can actually save you money on your deposit as well. I know for myself, I was able to only deposit down $500 instead of a full month's rent because of my credit score, which was really nice. Credit will certainly be important for an auto loan. Um, we're going to walk through an auto loan example here in a few slides of how having a good credit score can really save you a lot of money in the long run when it comes to an auto loan. Mortgage or a home loan, absolutely. This will probably be a time where credit is most important. Um, I know for a lot of us, buying a house is one of the biggest purchases that we make. Um, so having a good, strong score is very important and can save you a lot of money there as well. Um, when you do apply for a mortgage, we will pull all three of your credit scores. So one from each of the credit bureaus. And then auto insurance. Having a good credit score can actually save you money on your auto insurance premiums. Um, so that was one that I did not know before I took this class. A credit score is not important for a payday loan. Um, so even though it has the name loan in there, it is not checked when you go to apply for a payday loan. So oftentimes payday loans have very, very high interest rates. Um, so I recommend avoiding these if you can. And then lastly, a pawn shop. Your credit score is not important or not checked at a pawn shop. Discussing FICO credit scores. So FICO scores are the most commonly used scoring model. Um, they're used by about 90% of lenders across the US. And the scores will range anywhere from 300 as the lowest to 850 as the highest. Um, and the higher the score you have, the better off you are to being approved for loans and such. 
as I've mentioned a couple of times, I really reiterate this point. Um, the Your FICO score is based only on the information in your credit report. So that is why it's just so important to look over those very carefully. You will have three FICO scores, as I mentioned, one from each credit bureau. Um, so like I said, when you apply for a mortgage, we will pull all three. Um, when you apply for just like a credit card or an auto loan or something like that, oftentimes we only pull one score. And your FICO score is based off of five different categories. Um, the importance of these categories will vary by person depending on their credit profile. So how much credit do you have available? How long have you been using it? What do your payments look like? Um, and so on. So it really depends um, on each individual, but we're gonna go through these categories on the next slide. So factors that determine a FICO score. So first is payment history, and this is 35%. So just by making on-time payments to your lines of trade, your credit card, auto loan, mortgage, um, that's 35% of your credit score. And when we say um, payment history, we're looking at a few different things here. We're looking at how recent was the most recent delinquency, uh, collection, or public record item. How severe was the worst delinquency? Was it 30 days late? Was it 60 or 90 days? Um, how many credit obligations or accounts have you been late on? Um, also, on-time payments to installment loans, like your auto loan, personal loan, mortgage, do help your credit score a little more than on-time payments to revolving loans, um, but it's really just what works best for you. We never recommend going into costly debt to build up your score. Um, like for myself, I just started building credit with one credit card and then eventually um, I needed to get an auto loan. So that's when I decided to get my first installment loan there. Next is credit utilization. And this can also sometimes be called any outstanding debt. And that's 30% of your credit score. So just these top two here alone are 65% of your FICO score. Um, so with this one, this is looking at your credit utilization. So those outstanding balances on credit cards, how high are those? And then also any collection accounts will also be taken into consideration here. Next is length of credit history, which is 15%. So this is looking at how long your accounts have been established, the average number of months each account has been open. And then it also does look at new accounts, the number of months it's been since your most recent account opening. Um, so I really only recommend applying for credit when you really need it. Um, and when you do open a new credit card or something like that, trying to keep it open for as long as possible, as long as you're not incurring a bunch of fees, um, just to extend the length of your credit history. Amount of new credit, um, that's 10% of your FICO score. So looking at new credit, we're talking about um, your increase, so the number of months and how many inquiries you've had in the last 12 months. It also takes into consideration new accounts, the number of trade lines you've opened within the last year. Um, and just so you know, FICO scores only consider consumer initiated inquiries for the credit posted in the last 12 months. So for example, if you're someone, I know I've received them, receive one of those, you know, you've been pre-qualified for this credit card at this rate. Um, I know a lot of us probably get those in the mail. Um, those are not impacting your FICO score. So keep that in mind. Lastly, types of credit in use, this is also 10%. Um, so with this one, it's saying, you know, it's good to have a mix of both revolving and installment loans. But like I said, we never recommend going into a lot of debt just to build credit because there's a lot of affordable ways to do so. And we'll discuss those here shortly. Um, and just so you know, like the last three um, of your these last three categories do matter, but really focus on the first two, payment history and credit utilization, keeping those balances low. All right, if we can think back to our four individuals, um, we had Brad, we had Greg, we had Helen, and we had Sarah. Um, just think for a second, you can throw it in the chat box if you want to, who do you think had the highest credit score? 
The answer here is Helen. Um, so Helen had the best credit score out of everyone we saw there. All of her stuff was current, paid on time. Um, she has a long credit history. So she had a lot going for her. She would have had the highest score. And a lot of times I'll get a question, um, is having a credit score the most important financial skill? Um, and I say no, credit is a very important tool for money management, but it's not your only tool. Um, it's something that can be helpful and save you money on loans and such. But like I said, we don't ever want anyone going into costly debt to build up their score. And the best way to manage your money is just a way that helps you reach your financial goals. And it's tied to your values and priorities. So this is that auto loan example I was talking about. So this is a dollar impact of a credit score auto loan example. Um, these are not our current rates right now. This is just an example made for the purpose of this class. Um, but when you do apply for a loan, it will be set up kind of in a tiered system like this. So if your score ranges from this to this, you'll receive this interest rate. Um, so in this example, we're going to be looking at someone who has the highest interest rate at that four, per, or excuse me, the lowest interest rate and the highest credit score at 4% versus someone who has a lower credit score with a higher interest rate at 17.25%. That's a, that's a high rate. So here we're looking at the cost difference. So that 4% versus 17.25, we have the same loan amount here, $10,000 over the course of five years. The monthly payment differs by about $65. Um, when I initially did this, I was like, oh, okay, $65 doesn't seem you know, too bad. But when we look at the total interest paid over the life of the loan, we're looking at close to $4,000. Um, and I'm sure most of us here could think of $4,000 worth of things we'd rather spend our money on um, than interest on an auto loan. Another common question I get about credit is, can you have a credit score without using credit? And the answer is no. Someone who does not use credit would just have no credit score. So they wouldn't have a 300 um, or something low. They would just have no score. And the reason for that is because you need regularly reported on-time payments to build up credit. And oftentimes it takes about six months to build a solid FICO credit score. Um, you know, when you start building credit, they don't just throw you to the wolves and make you start at 300 and work your way all the way up to that 850. Um, but what they'll do is they'll kind of just take a, um, they'll, they'll kind of throw you somewhere in the middle based off of your credit usage. So as long as you're not maxing out cards and you're paying things on time, um, they should throw you somewhere in the middle. And one thing is you can be considered a risky borrower if there's no history or data of repayment behavior. So that is one thing that lenders are checking when they pull your credit report is how many other credit obligations have they paid on time or have they paid off completely? <clears throat> Now, this is a really cool example I like to walk through. So feel free to just kind of check out some of these things as I'm discussing here. Um, but we have five different individuals, Rachel, Sophia, Mike, David, and Maria, um, and they all have different credit makeup. So you can see that there are different credit utilization levels. You can see that Sophia's and Mike's are a little bit higher than everyone else's. Um, they have different revolving balances. So when I say revolving balances, that means um, outstanding balances on their credit cards. So you can see that <clears throat> Mike and Rachel have some higher balances. Um, David has a really low balance there. Different lengths of credit history. Uh, Rachel, Mike, Maria have had several years. Sophia and David are um, a little bit newer to credit. Some of them have inquiries like Mike and Maria. Um, some of them have delinquencies, which is uh, just Sophia here. So as you can see, um, we give some different FICO scores based off of each person's credit makeup. And then on this next slide, we're going to look at a series of actions like missing a payment, getting a new loan, um, things like that to see how it's going to impact their credit score. 
All right, here we go. So we have everyone's score here at the top, and then we have a series of credit actions here on the left-hand side. So first we have missing a payment by 90, or excuse me, 30 days. Right below that, we have missing a payment by 90 days. So you can see the difference it makes in everyone's score. So it is better to fix those late payments earlier rather than just wait and let them go because it does make a difference for your credit score. Reducing revolving account balances by 25%. When I say reducing revolving account balances, that means lowering those credit card outstanding balances by 25%. So they're paying some of that stuff off. Um, so you can see everyone's score goes up a little bit here when we pay off some of those balances. Taking out a new $5,000 personal loan. So then they're applying for a new line of trade here. You're going to see everyone's score dip a little bit. And then lastly, maxing out on credit cards. You can see everyone's score here took a decent drop. Um, so missing a payment by 90 days and maxing out credit cards were the two most damaging actions um, in this example. Now, moving on to rebuilding credit um, or just building credit in an affordable way. So for some strategies for the highest credit score possible. If you are really trying to grow your score, really get it up there, keep those revolving loan balances like your credit cards up to 10% of your credit limit at all times. So that's really not putting a lot of money on those credit cards there. So if you've got a... Um, $1,000 credit card limit, um, that means you're only putting 100 bucks on there every month. Number two, set alerts to stay on track or pay down your balance multiple times a month. Um, so set an alert to pay off your credit card statement every month. And also if you see that your statement's getting a little bit high, you can make multiple payments to your credit card. That's totally fine. And then lastly, pay any credit card balances in full every month to avoid paying interest, which is a finance charge that goes towards those credit card companies. Um, there used to be this myth going around that you had to carry a balance on your credit cards to increase your credit score, and that's not true. You can just um, you know, put some money on there, 10% of your limit, and then pay it off every month, and that alone is helping to build your credit score. A few tools that we're gonna discuss for building credits, um, secured credit cards and credit builder loans and credit cards with no fees um, or very low fees. So credit cards, some of them out there are going to try and charge you 250 to you know $1,000 just to use a credit card. Um, I personally always just offer free credit cards because um, that's what works best for me. All right, first one we're gonna discuss here is the credit builder loan. I do have two slides on this one because it is a little bit different. Um, I don't know a ton of financial institutions that offer something like this, but basically I like to call the credit builder loan like a forced savings. Um, you establish on-time payments to build up your credit history and it's set up like an installment loan. So you just have a one-time monthly payment each month uh, for two years. One thing that is super awesome about the credit builder loan is there's no money upfront required and there's no credit qualification required either. Um, so it's very easy to open up one of these. You get to select your dollar amount, um, basically that you'll be saving up to over the course of two years, whether it's 500 or $1,000, that's your choice. Um, but it is locked in for a 24 month term. So I have a flow chart on the next slide that I think uh, helps explain this one a little bit. All right, so basically a member comes in, applies for a credit builder loan with no credit pull. And instead of us, we're gonna go with the $500 example. Instead of us just handing that member $500, we put that $500 in a 24 month certificate of deposit. So it's locked in there and it's earning interest for that 24 months. And then the member will pay back their loan in monthly installments. For a $500 credit builder loan for 24 months, we're looking at about $23 monthly payment. So a member makes their $23 monthly payment for 24 months. At the end of the loan or the end of the 24 months, the member will get that $500 
plus any interest it earned in that certificate of deposit. Um, I know certificate of deposit rates aren't crazy high right now, but um, any interest that you can earn is good. So um, the credit builder loan is a little bit different. If anyone has any questions on this, feel free to put those in the chat box. Um, but basically I like to say it's like a forced savings where you're putting $23 in each month for 24 months. And at the end of that 24 months, that's when you get the money back. Uh, and then the other option is the $1,000 for 24 months. That one's sitting at about $46 a month for that monthly payment. Uh, next, we have our starter visa credit card. So this is for someone with no previous credit history. So you've never used credit before. Credit before. When we pull that credit report, we're not going to see anything on there. <clears throat> so you must have no credit history and a verifiable income to qualify for this card. Um, so that can be a barrier for some people. If you have used credit before, um, this is not something that would be an option for you. Starter credit card limits are preset by the financial institution. At Zing, we set ours at $300, um, just so it's not too high, so they're not feeling that need to spend. And we also offer financial education so that that member is using a card, the card in a way that's going to be helping and building their credit and not hurting it. Um, one other great thing about the starter visa card is there's no security deposit or money down, which I know can be a barrier for some people. The last tool we're gonna to talk about today is secured credit cards. So with secured cards, you provide your own funds in a savings account to secure the card. Um, so basically, if you wanted a $500 credit card limit, you have to put $500 into a frozen savings account. Um, and basically what that does is it acts as a security deposit for the credit union. If you were to spend all that $500 on my credit card and then not pay it back, um, we have that on the back end. Um, but let's say you open this card and then you decide to close it later and you have it completely paid off. We do not keep that money. It is your money. The minimum balance will vary. So oftentimes we will say, you know, you have to have at least a $250 limit credit card. And the reason for that is because we want people to use the card in a way that's going to build their score. So if we're thinking 10% of 250, that's only $25 a month, really not a lot of money to put on that card there. So keep those balances low. Interest rates will, will vary, um, same with any credit card. So just read that fine print. Watch out for any fees, such as like a balance transfer fee, um, cash advance fee, uh, monthly user fee, anything like that. That's all gonna be in that small, small print. Um, and lastly, there's no credit pull required at some financial institutions for a secured card. And one other thing I want to add about secured credit cards, um, especially with Zing that are really cool, is you can open the secured card. Um, let's say you use it for two to three years and you're like, I want to get that money and that frozen savings back to me. Um, basically, what we would do is we'd have you apply for an unsecured card, so a credit card that doesn't have a security deposit tied to it. And from there, um, we could transition the card from secured to unsecured. So you're able to keep that line of trade open for as long as possible, and we're not closing one card and then opening the other. Um, so that's one benefit of secured credit cards as well. Some strategies for great credit. So check your credit report at least annually for free. Um, that annualcreditreport.com website is a fantastic resource. Also the Experian website, you can get a free copy of your Experian credit report and your Experian FICO score once a month. Pay your bills on time and pay off collection accounts. So as we said, payment history is 35% of your FICO score um, and credit utilization or outstanding debt is 30%. Keep amounts owed low on those revolving lines like credit cards. So 10% or less of your credit limit for the highest score possible or up to 30% of your credit limit to maintain a good credit score. I personally always like to stay at that 10 or 15% or less mark. 
keep your history as long as possible, um, unless you're incurring a lot of fees for keeping a credit card open or something like that, um, then that's not worth it. But if you're not receiving any fees, try and keep that credit history as long as possible. Keep increase to the necessary and only apply for credit when you need it. And then lastly, having a mix of credit, so both revolving um, and installment loans if possible. Um, but like I said, only get credit when you need it. We do have some time for questions. Um, one other thing I will throw out there is if you are a member of Zing Credit Union, um, I forgot to throw these in the slides here, but we do have a free credit scoring on our app and you can also use our credit simulator. So you can check and see if I were to get a new auto loan, how is that going to impact my score? Or if I miss a payment, how is that going to impact my score? So um, the free credit monitoring is a really useful tool on the Zing Credit Union app if you um, are a member and wanna check that out. But um, we do have a bit of time for questions. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to submit them in the chat box. Otherwise you are good to go. And I appreciate everyone attending today. I have taken attendance. Um, so yeah, if you are ready to go, feel free to enjoy the rest of your day. I got a question here um, and I did not mention this, so I apologize, but does closing a credit card affect your credit score? And the answer here is yes. It will have the same impact, um, normally dropping about three to five points, like same as when you apply. So anytime you close a line of trade, for example, even paying off my car loan ended up decreasing my credit score a little bit because I technically closed that line of trade because I paid it off. Um, so yes, closing a credit card will impact your credit score. It will drop your score about three to five points. But as long as you're not closing a ton of lines of credit at one time, your score should bounce back within a month or two. Um, and one thing to point out with that is regardless of if you closed it as the card holder or if the card issuer um, closed it, it will still impact your score no matter who closes the card. Of course. Um, I have another question here. Can someone inherit credit if they're added to someone else's credit card? And that's a good question. So the first thing is um, people can, or someone can't have um, a credit score until they're 18, but uh, we have had members that will add their children to their credit card as an authorized user. And by them using that card and their name being associated with that credit account, that can help build their credit score. Um, I do believe that when they have their own line of credit, like account in just their name, it may carry a little bit more weight for their score. But um, if you're referring to, you know, if someone, if you're a parent and adding your child to your account as an authorized user, yes, that will help to increase their score. What's the youngest age kids can start to earn credit? That's a great question. And that is 18. So I always recommend that um, parents or uh, students that turn 18 pull their credit report right away. Um, the reason for that is you can't have access to credit until you're 18. Um, and so that way, if there is anything on your credit report um, that's not there or that's, or excuse me, that's fraudulent or there's accounts on there, it's really easy to remove those when someone just turns 18 because we know they can't have access to credit until then. Good question. Um, someone was told the credit union shared when you marry a man, you marry his debt. Is that still accurate? Um, I would say you, I will say, your partner's debt will impact um, you if you're going to be jointly buying something. So for example, if you were to want to buy a house together, uh, the credit union will look at both your and your partner's debts to see what your debt to income ratio is. Um, so that would be one time where your partner's debts may impact yours if you're borrowing together. But let's say if you were just gonna go buy your own car loan um, and you're not on any of your partner's debts, we wouldn't see that. Um, even though you're married, if you're not on the loan or on the account, um, you're not tied to that necessarily. Hopefully, hopefully that answered the question. So 
So I would say if you're, if you're going to be borrowing jointly, um, yes, that could impact your, your buying power or, um, your partner's debts could impact your buying power. But if you're not on the loan and you're just buying something yourself and applying for the loan yourself, um, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Yeah, can we go over the credit builder again? Absolutely. Let me hop back over to those slides. Yeah, no problem. <clears throat> so you do have to be a member to um, open a credit builder loan. Some people, they come here just for the credit builder loan. They'll just put $5 into their savings account, open their credit builder loan, um, and go from there. <clears throat> so you don't have to open a checking account. Um, you're more than welcome to. Checking accounts are $0 at the credit union, and they're completely free. So the $500 or $1,000, you as a member get to pick that dollar amount. Um, so like I said, if you choose the $500 amount, you're going to be paying about $23 a month for two years. And then at the end of the two years is when you get the money back. Um, and if you do the $1,000 option, you'd come in, apply for the credit builder loan, say, I want the $1,000 one. You'll be making like your $46 monthly payment over the course of two months. And then at the end of that, or excuse me, 24 months, at the end of that 24 months, that's when you get the money back. So how it works is since you're making those monthly on-time payments, that's what we're using to build your credit score there. Did that help at all? I know I, I really struggled with the credit builder loan when I first joined the credit union, kind of understanding it. Um, but basically, I like to just tell people, think of it as a forced savings account. You're forced to put $25 into savings every month. And at the end of that two years, that's when you get the money back. The biggest thing with the credit builder loan I tell people is just make sure that you're going to be able to afford that monthly payment, that $23 or $46 payment um, over the course of two years. Another way to think of it is, um, Right, so it's not a loan to take out and pay other cards, no. Um, basically, like I said, kind of that forced savings, putting money in every month at the end of the month or those two years, that's when you get the money back. If you're ever interested in something like a loan to take out to pay other cards, um, you could do like a personal loan or you could do a balance transfer. So if you've got a couple credit cards that are really high interest rate, you can transfer that balance to a lower interest rate credit card. Um, like at the credit union as of today, June 14th, 2022, our credit card rates are 12.99%, which are pretty low compared to the national average around 20%. Um, so yeah, there are options for loans to take out to pay off credit cards if that's something you're interested in. Um, but yeah, great question. Any other questions today? All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here. Um, but feel free to put in any more questions if you have them.